Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture Crop Top webinar series. If you have any questions during this presentation, please type them into the questions section of the GoToWebinar menu, and we will answer them at the end of each presentation. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. I'd like to welcome everybody to the July 3rd Crop Talk, and uh, as we uh, get a bit of rain and some warmer weather we can definitely see the crops advancing and uh and actually uh in a lot of uh, a lot of issues a lot of different crops starting to catch up to where they normally would be at this time of year with that uh we're getting into the time of year where uh we're starting to be concerned regarding uh uh diseases in cereal crops as well as uh, oil seed crops and i thought it'd be a great time to uh get uh Dave Kaminsky on our uh, our field crop pathologist and uh, he's going to talk today about uh, identifying some of the different diseases that are out there on some of the crops and talk a bit about uh, application timing. Uh, that's probably one of the most critical things when we get out there and start applying the fungicides. So uh, we'll start with that and then uh, there's been a couple insects that have popped up uh, uh, are the, starting to create some concerns in some of the areas. And uh, so I was getting a few calls regarding wheat midge. I thought it'd be good if we could get uh, John Gavlowski to come up and, on today and talk a little bit about wheat midge. And then uh, later on, towards the end of last week there, we uh, started to see some alfalfa weevil showing up in uh, some of the alfalfa crops. So I thought, again, it'd be a great time to get uh, John to talk about the identification and uh, control measures if required on, on any of these ones. So with that, uh, Laurie, we'll let uh, Dave start it off and we'll talk a little bit about diseases. Good morning. Morning, Dave, we can hear you perfect. All right, good. Well, the one thing I changed in my title is you had disease identification and fungicide application timing. I changed my title to disease anticipation because I think that you'll see that the diseases we're talking about today are things that you're quite familiar with. The commonality is that uh, both of the major diseases we're talking about, we need some kind of predictive method to anticipate fungicide timing. If we wait to see evidence of disease, it's too late. So how do I advance my slides? <laughs> uh, Lori, help me out. Uh, if you want to just uh, the bottom left corner of your slide, they'll, if you put your cursor over there, you'll see an, uh, an arrow yeah. forward. Try that. There we go. Thank you. First up is uh, Fusarium head blight. And as I said, once you see these kind of symptoms, it's way too late. And these are the first signs you'll see that there is infection there. That's the fungus itself sporulating, um, producing spores that can infect uh, other crops if there is a rain splash. But the spores that I've got here have been there for quite some time. By this stage, probably about two weeks. So we use a, a model a forecast which tries to determine what the risk is today if your crop is at a susceptible stage and that susceptible stage is um, heads have cleared the boot they have not yet flowered preferably um, you want to catch most of the crop before it has flowered and coat the heads with fungicide as a preventative against infection uh, what you see on the screen right now is yesterday's map. Two days map doesn't usually appear until uh, five o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, this map also has behind it an animation which shows the forecast over the last seven days. So it shows you the way things are moving. Um, back a few days, the risk was higher in most regions depending on where you are. Um, you see that most of the province is now at low to medium risk. 
that might surprise some people, but that's what it is today. I provided links here and uh, I won't go into them right now or run the animation, but you can do that on your own. Um, perhaps I make a, present, a copy of the presentation available to folks later on if they're interested. The model looks back in time to the previous seven days and during that time, how much rainfall, not volume amount, but how many hours during the day of those previous seven days we've had rainfall and how much of that time the temperature has been in the ideal range. And that range is 15 to 30 degrees Celsius. So you can see the low temperatures over the last seven days have been dipping down below that uh, 15 degree. And um, we have had some showers, yes, but they have uh, come and gone quite quickly. We're not getting big amounts. Humidity is really the key to infection. Uh, humidity over 85% is required when the temperature is in the ideal range. And this is yesterday's plot from Carmen. Uh, let's see. Let's... There's the key portion where uh, the humidity is above 85% and the temperature is still in that uh, favorable range. It's a very short period during that 24 hour time period, two hours. That's why infection can be so surgical. It may only happen to those uh, parts of the head that flower during that period, and flowering doesn't happen all at once. Um, we had some showers on this day. You can see 1.4 millimeters since midnight. So the conditions were there to drive spores up into the air. And if the crop is unprotected <clears throat> during that two hour period, there is a possibility for infection. So if we had our fungicide on, um, that we got our bases covered. I mentioned the animation and oh, look, it's gonna actually run for us. So this is uh, going back. If you follow the dates at the top, there's June 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. So this goes through the weekend, July 1st, Canada Day, and July 2nd, which was yesterday. I'll let this run, and that gives you an idea of how dynamic this forecast is and how quickly it changes from day to day. In response to those things that are happening at each of the yellow dots on the map, the hours of the day with precipitation and hours of the day where the temperature for infection is in the ideal range. So this picture was also taken yesterday here in Carmen in a commercial spring wheat plot on our U of M farm. That crop was seeded on May the 13th and it has, I would say, completed flowering on the main heads. The anthers are out and visible so in this case, it's probably too late for a fungicide if the fusarium risk had been high at the time of flowering. In this field, we saw really only minor tan spot. That's down in the lower part of the canopy. Uh, there's been no sign of leaf rust. So there was no point to us applying a foliar fungicide to that crop. And looking back, I think, uh, it was not necessary to apply a, a head blight product. That we'll, we'll tell you later on how that turned out, but uh, generally we don't when it's been so dry. Okay, the timing for fungicide application is uh, difficult and it varies a little with crops. Barley is now a crop that you can apply a, a head blight fungicide for, and in this case, you're applying your protectant before the head has fully emerged. That's a little bit counter to uh, what happens in wheat. 
Um, so that's a unique difficulty. I again, put a link to a very complex but uh, informative serial staging guide. It comes from Bayer, but it's not biased because it's all, also uh, from OMAFRA, our Ontario colleagues, and the University of Guelph. So it's just detail on uh, staging of these cereal crops and uh, potentially ideal timing. You've got to study up on uh, when is the ideal stage and you or your crop scout has to determine what is the ideal time. It can be very difficult in a crop that because it's uh, patchy or emerged at different times is very stagey. That is you have some heads that have flowered and some that are just coming out of the boot. That's tricky. But we generally aim for protecting those that are going to give us the bulk of our yield. And you can go too late with the fungicide spray. Um, so concentrate on those early tillers. Uh, what are the products? Well, um, these are the ones that are being used right now, according to Lionel. Caramba is probably the most popular. Procero is also popular. Uh, Folicure is now less used, and there are generic knockoffs. That's why we list it as Tebiconazole. All three of these uh, trade names, um, there you see the part of the word or the chemical name conazole. They're all triazole fungicides. They're all group three. Um, so if you've been using similar group three products on foliar timing, uh, you wanna be cautious about that. You may be repeatedly using the same group of fungicide in a crop, inadvertently selecting for resistance in pathogens. Now, I think Lionel gave me one question about fungicide for head blight, and that is rain fastness. I did some studying up, and I found that the labels of all of those three registered products are silent on the matter of rain fastness. That is, if I know that rain is coming, how long do I need to have a dry period after application for the product? to not be washed off of the crop. One thing I did find is that one of those two products, I'll go back for a moment, Caramba is metconazole, and another metconazole product has a two hour rain fastness suggestion. So you can use that as a rule of thumb. The other thing is that uh, perhaps more important than rain fastness of the product is coverage. You want to get that product on the heads, and that is a vertical target orientation of nozzles and ground speed. Uh, wind speed and direction can all affect how well you get that product onto the target area. Now we'll switch gears and talk about sclerotinia. Uh, there's a crop in full flower. If you recognize it, it's not canola. I believe that's mustard, but that's just to help me transition into what we're gonna talk about next, which is sclerotinia. And here is the interesting and complex life cycle of a very primitive pathogen with a wide host range. I put in the life cycle, not for the canola crop, but in the soybean crop to help me remember that uh, this disease affects virtually all broadleaf crops. And it starts with um, the resting structures, those little black things that look like mouse turds, I guess. Um, they survive from year to year. They can live quite happily near the soil surface for three years or longer. When the soil has been wet, that is at or near saturation for a period of minimum seven days. That's when they start to germinate as little mushroom-like structures known as apothecia. That's what we see on the left side. 
And once those uh, have emerged and produced caps, they kind of like look like little tan golf tees that have been pushed down into the soil from the upper surface of those apothecia, ascospores are blasting off. Ascospores do not have enough energy to cause infection directly. They rely on the easy sugars that they get from petals and petals may or may not fall off. In the soybean crop, generally infections start where those flowers are, right at the um, axle of the leaves. In canola, it's another matter. Um, the ascospores colonize the petals and it's when they fall down onto leaves or leaf axles that infection can begin. You also need free moisture, that is water droplets, uh, to be there about 24 hours for an infection to launch wherever the uh, combination of fungus and sugars and petals and water exists. So here are some pictures that Lionel sent me taken by an agronomist, uh, his name Todd Drummond, and these are actually from 2017, um, but they show the size of the initials when they first come out of the soil, that finger on the left side of the screen. On the right side of the screen is what they look like after they've expanded. Um, the one that is the most cupped is probably just about finished pumping out spores and is about to dry and wither. But one sclerotium can produce multiple apothecia, which can be pumping out spores for days into a week, perhaps, and uh, millions and millions of spores. So once these are out there, um, we have to be concerned about potential for infection in all of the crops that we're monitoring. Uh, this again gives you an idea of size. That is a single sclerotium with five or six apothecia. And uh, you can see that their stalks are very short. It's only the resting structures that are within one or two centimeters of the soil surface that have a chance of uh, germinating and producing spores. Most of the province, we have not really had the conditions that favor the surface of the soil being that wet for that length of time. I heard some reports yesterday of people seeing apothecia in the Morden area. Uh, I don't know if Lionel found anyone who's out scouting last night. If you're scouting, this is one uh, look-alike to be aware of. It's the bird's nest fungus. Um, it's actually quite different, but before the structures open, you might look down at those two on the left and say, oh, well, that, maybe those are apothecia. Once they've opened, they have these little egg packets, which are actually spore packets inside. Uh, those are actually a beneficial or benign uh, structure fungus. It's found on right on canola stubble, and it's usually helping to break down that old stubble. What is the ideal timing for um, sclerotinia products? Well, many consider this to be the best window, sometime between 20% bloom and 50% bloom. And in some ways that's a little bit subjective. We have uh, the pictures on the bottom part of the screen. That's not subjective, that's a, a very good approximation, but it's when you're looking at the crop that it's tough to say, again, especially with a stagey crop, where am I at? 20%, 50%, 70%. So this is the ideal window. And what we're trying to do is coat the plant um, when blossoms are beginning to fall because infection in canola can't happen before Blossoms are beginning to fall down into the canopy. And what is the, the risk of there being uh, ascospores floating around at that time? Well, dry as it's been, I think there is 
or has been very little risk up to now. And there aren't many areas of the province where we've had enough rainfall to keep the soil wet for the time it needs for aphthisia to be produced. Where you're most likely to find them if you're looking is in a cereal crop that has been grown on say canola or soybean stubble. Um, the crop, the cereal crop canopies early so it keeps or has the potential to keep the soil moist for that length of time. And it's also easier to look under that kind of canopy. In a canola crop, it's virtually impossible to find those structures. What products are being used right now? Uh, well, we have three main alternatives, Proline, Quadris, <clears throat> Cotegra is a newer product. We have a range of chemistries here. Lionel mentioned that Astound is being used. It's no longer in the crop protection guide. The reason being that it's been discontinued, I think by the manufacturer, um, but it is still a registered product. If you have stores, you can use it up. So Proline is Prothioconazole, a group three. Quadris is Azoxystrobin, a group 11, or Strobi as some people know them. And Cotegra, is uh, two actives, boscolid group seven and prothioconazole group three. Um, those multiple ingredient products are the ones that uh, will help us fight off resistance. I think you'll only use a fungicide once in a canola crop, although uh, at times people use a a two-stage application because the flowering period is prolonged for whatever reason and that varies crop to crop year to year and um, I think that's enough said about that. I think I'm at a point where I can take a few questions. And I, do have a, I do have a question uh, hey. David. Um, how long do sclerotia bodies stay viable in the soil? Um, they, I think a rule of thumb is uh, three years. That's why uh, a four-year rotation could help to get rid of sclerotia in the soil. But now we grow so many susceptible crops in rotation that that's getting hard to maintain. And furthermore, um, well, I should just keep my answer short. Three years, a rule of thumb. Okay, that's all I have. And if you have some, Lionel. Uh, yeah. Um, Dave, were you maybe going to mention that because uh, we have canola adjacent to fields that were canola, that the spores and the amount of spores being released make it even the four year rotation hard to? Yes. Uh, that's where I was going with that comment, Lionel. Thanks for picking up on that. Yeah, ascospores can blow and cause significant infection a quarter mile away, half mile away. So an adjacent crop, say that uh, wheat crop on canola stubble, where we find the first apothecia, if that's nearby your susceptible crop, that's the source of your uh, infection, the inoculum. And um, the prevailing winds are going to bring those over your crop. So if you know you've had conditions where apathesia are likely in your area, uh, that's what we go on for a, a predictive, preventative kind of approach to management with fungicides. Okay, and I might have missed it, but did you mention uh like uh, how long it would take for a sclerotia body to germinate. We've been getting some rainfalls over the past two weeks here, a week and a half anyways, and that top soil surface has been getting some moisture. I was just wondering if, was there a time period of how long it takes them to germinate or what is it? If a there, science? Yeah. 
if the if the sclerotia are right near the surface, it doesn't take them very long to germinate and emerge. However, they will have to have experienced conditions of near saturation for a minimum of five up to seven days before they will germinate. So the soil has to get wet and stay wet for that length of time before we're going to see any of the germination. But once that process has started, um, you know, by the end of those five days, it's going to be a very short time before the apothecial initials are coming out of the soil. And so about seven days until they're pumping out spores like the Dickens. Okay, and one more question regarding sclerotinia. We've had uh, lots of issues with canola this year regarding flea beetles and cutworms and just even poor germination off the start. So we got a lot of crop out there that is really variable in stages. Mm -hmm. um, is that going to mean we could have, you had mentioned about, that, so about spraying fields twice in some cases. Uh, could we see the initial flowering go okay and then we might have concerns for the later flowering or, you know, is there any kind of recommendations or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think if your crop is uh, stagey, that you probably have an open canopy in which you don't have ideal conditions for infection, even if the petals are falling. So the earlier timing might not really uh, be necessary. And you know that the crop is going to continue flowering longer. And uh, you know how the canola crop also compensates and fills in vacant spaces. So there's going to be a point where the canopy is much more dense and the likelihood of significant infection is greater. So you might get away with a single application later on, but um, I think I would start when I know that we've had conditions for spore release happen and the canopy is dense. That's when I would start. And then you have to evaluate um, is the bloom going on for a long period after that? And do we have disease conducive conditions? If it straight stays dry as it has been, um, it's, it's a question that has, you have to struggle with kind of for the next couple of weeks. Okay, that's a real good comments on, on the uh, sclerotinia. Uh, on the wheat uh, or the fusarium, I got a, a question that was texted into me. It says, uh, uh, regarding early mornings and fog conditions, uh, does that have anything to deal or should we be concerned, I guess, with those conditions and fusarium development? Early morning dew and fog, not, not alone. Um, I mean, those are conditions where you might have some minor infection, but if it's just minor infection, it happens now, it stays dry later on, those infected kernels are not harvested. It's the ones that uh, start to grow, then get infected, um, that are more like a, a plump kernel and will be harvested. So again, we're not getting prolonged conditions when um, we have the coincidence of heat and humidity. Just walking through a, a field and finding that your pants are wet in the morning is not an indication of humidity. Um, I have found through kind of long experience in Manitoba that if we have a period where you've got to um, use your air conditioner in your house because the humidity is oppressive, that's when we really have to uh, be hyper vigilant about fusarium. Okay, and then just one more question regarding uh, the staging of wheat. 
uh, you showed uh, the one picture there where the anthers were visible on the outside of the head and basically saying that that is past the timing of spraying. Uh, where do you kind of, when you go out to yeah. look at the field, what are you looking for when you're out there? <laughs> Finally, I don't get out of my office enough to uh, look at a lot of fields. Uh, so I, I can't answer that question fairly. Um, but that picture just tells you that that head has now flowered and that was the main, main tiller. Um, you may have the others following in behind that are just about to. Why is flowering important? Well, um, the, the glooms have to physically open to chuck those anthers out. And it takes a very short time, but it's when the glooms are hanging open that there is the maximum opportunity for uh, fusarium spores that are floating about to get inside and cause infection. So that's one of the, the elements of susceptibility. Great, that's what I was looking for. Um, great, well, thanks a lot, Dave. Uh, that was a real good presentation. Uh, we got some good information regarding our, uh, our two major crops regarding diseases. And uh, I think uh, that's gonna go a long way over the next uh, week to 10 days here as producers are out there checking and making that decision as whether they should spray or not. So thanks for coming on, Dave, and good presentation. And we will turn it over to, uh, to John Gavlosky now, and we're gonna talk a little bit about a couple of the insect issues that have popped up over the last uh, week or so here. So uh, John, if you're ready, we'll just jump right into yours. Okay, sounds good. Uh, so the two things that uh, Lionel asked me to speak on are alfalfa weevil and wheat midge. Now alfalfa weevil, it's an insect that we struggled with for um, a few years in a row, um, about starting about five or six years ago until about last year. And then the population kind of province-wise started to go down and actually crashed pretty good last year. But there's still some pockets where we do have some higher levels. So I'm going to go over, first of all, how do you look for alfalfa weevil? And if you do, if you're in one of these areas that still has some high pockets, what do you do? And I'll touch on why uh, the population seems to overall be dropping. And we'll also touch on wheat midge from the perspective of uh, when should you be looking, what you, should you be looking for, and what is your risk. So those are the things that we will be covering. Oops, too far. Here we go. So that's my summary. So alfalfa weevil, what is it? Um, so the adult stage uh, is what we call a true weevil. So it's a... Uh, basically a, a light brown beetle and you will notice a dark brown stripe that runs right across the head, thorax and onto the abdomen. Uh, it'll be the only weevil in alfalfa that has that marking on it and weevils have a snout at the front of their head. Uh, it's not a beak to suck sap with, there's actually mandibles at the end of it so they're a chewing insect and the adult will chew a little hole. The adults over winter, they'll chew a little hole in the alfalfa stem, put their eggs in there, and usually by about very late May or early June, you start getting these green larvae. When they first hatch out, they're more of a yellow color, and as they grow through their four stages, they start turning uh, more like a, a deeper green. One thing that's very distinctive is they have a white line that runs right down the back of their body. So there's really, there's, there's two caterpillars that have this white, green with white line down the back in alfalfa. And I, I made a mistake, they're calling them a caterpillar because technically they're not, they're a beetle larva. Um, so being a beetle larva, they don't have all the prolegs and things of a caterpillar. So. We'll call them a beetle larva, not really a caterpillar in this case. Uh, there's one other beetle larva 
that has these markings as the uh, clover leaf weevil. Clover leaf weevil has more of a light brown head. Alfalfa weevil, green, white stripe, it has more of a black head to it. So that's uh, what alfalfa weevil looks like. They, they're a foliator, but they like to feed high on the plant. So the upper leaves, the buds, the flowers, that's where they like to do their feeding. And right around now, you'll start noticing these uh, silky cases, either on the plants or on the soil. And if you look inside the case, you will see the green larva. By this point, the larva has started to shrink. It stopped feeding. It's shrunk a little bit, and it's made a silken case. That's the pupil stage of a falfa weevil. So it'll remain this way for a couple weeks, and then they become adults again. And that's how they finish their cycle for the season and how they overwinter. So that's what they look like. So alfalfa weevil injury is mainly a first cut issue for hay growers. Um, that larval stage we talked about, that's usually present throughout June and into early July. Uh, this year has been overall a bit cooler than normal, so you'll probably see that larval stage persist till about mid-July, but by by about the 14th, 15th of July, it, they should mainly be pupa. So they'll be around for another week to 10 days or so as larva. They are getting bigger. They'll be stopping feeding. Um, by the time the next cut starts coming up, hopefully we'll be out of the woods. Uh, the, the, the adult feeding is really inconsequential. It's that June and early July larval feeding that you need to be concerned over. And again, soon that will be coming to an end. So as far as how much damage can they do, there's been some studies on this. Uh, the one that's usually referred to uh, is one from the US. And what they found was the amount of yield loss depends on how tall the canola is when they're doing this feeding. So if you have a population of one larva per stem, and your crop is about 30 centimeters high, you're losing about 0.4 tons of dry hay per acre. If the crop is about 40 centimeters high, then you're losing less. You'll be losing about 0.1 tons per acre. So as the crop gets bigger, it can tolerate a lot more feeding. It compensates better, and your yield loss is lower. So that's one thing to, to factor in if you're trying to decide how economical is this population in my field? How tall is your crop and how heavy is that population? So based on that, there are economic thresholds or action thresholds. The suggested threshold is if the crop is under 30 centimeters, you would use one larva per stem as your action threshold. When you start getting between 30, 40 centimeters on average, you can probably tolerate about two larvae per stem, but once you start hitting that, anything greater, uh, that's when action becomes economical, and we'll go over in a second what action means. Uh, once the crop gets above about 40 centimeters, again, it can tolerate a bit more, but if on average you've got three larvae per stem, then some action may be economical for you. On the regrowth, just keep an eye on it. Again, hopefully by the time the regrowth comes along, the population's pupating, getting lower, but do keep an eye on it. And if you're seeing two or more active larva per crown, uh, that's the point when, again, action would be economical. And as far as how do you sample for them to determine these levels, the, the technique that is most commonly used is something called the shake bucket method. And the way this technique works is you go and you cut or break 10 stems, you shake them over a bucket, so shake bucket method, and you count the larva. And after you shake the stems, you might want to just inspect the tips a bit just to make sure you didn't miss any. Um, one word of caution, if you disturb the plants too much as you're removing them, you lose larva. So you could use pruning shears or something and very gently try to break those stems. And then again, just uh, turn it, uh, take the stem, uh, put it over a bucket, give it a shake, and again, do that 10 times. That's your shake bucket method. Uh, some people do like using sweep nets to sample. The problem is we don't have good data relating 
sweep net catches two economic thresholds. And part of the problem, and the reason we don't, is because using a sweep net, the counts can be quite variable. So for a hay crop, probably the most accurate way of doing it is that shake bucket method, because uh, once again, we just don't have good data relating it to yield loss for sweep net sampling. We do use sweep net sampling for seed alfalfa to uh, make decisions. Hay crops, um, again, the shake bucket method is preferred. So when you're uh, doing your sampling, note whether you are finding larvae that are starting to pupate. And if you see a lot of pale larvae that aren't that more vibrant green but are more large but pale yellow, they're probably diseased or parasitized, so uh, consider that with your decision making. So we talked about actions for alfalfa weevil. The easiest way to manage this insect is to cut a bit early if you have that option. Um, insecticides are an option, but uh, they don't always work great. Uh, a lot of people have called me when we were having our really bad years and said they used pyrethroids, they used organophosphates, they used several different things and did not think they got great control. And it might be tricky with alfalfa weevil sometimes getting the product to the alfalfa weevil larva because sometimes they are kind of right in the buds and uh, many times people have reported they just didn't get great contact or great control. But an easy method to uh, manage them in a hay crop is just an early cut. And as a general guideline, if the alfalfa is 40 centimeters or more in height, early cutting will kill the larva. So what cutting does is when you cut the crop, again, the larva don't have legs like uh, a proper caterpillar. So they, they can't march out of the field like army worms could. So basically, if you cut, they will desiccate and uh, end up drying out and dying as that crop is drying down. So cutting in many years is the preferred method of dealing with them and probably the most uh, economical and successful way of dealing with them. And again, we do encourage you to check your regrowth after a few days just to make sure that there aren't uh, residual um, alfalfa weevils feeding on that regrowth. Now, in theory, they should have been killed by the cut, but uh, with some of the newer varieties, they, the regrowth comes up really quick. And if you get some damp, humid weather after you did that cut, you may have regrowth before the larva really had a chance to desiccate. So those are conditions when you really need to keep an eye on that regrowth. So before we wrap up with alfalfa weevil, why the swing in populations? Uh, a couple years ago at this time, I was getting calls from right across Manitoba, people complaining about how bad alfalfa weevil was. And then last year, the calls really uh, came to an end. And this year, they continue to decline. And again, there's a few pockets, I think, in the southwest where we've got some higher levels persisting. But overall, levels are declining. And I've got two things on my screen here that are seem to be really helping out. There's a very small wasp called Bathyplectes curculionis. And when we first started surveying for alfalfa weevil several years ago, we could find them, but we had to look really hard to find them. So they were here, but they were in very low numbers. Uh, we did do some surveying three years ago and two years ago, and we noticed the populations really starting to increase for Bathyplectes. So they're likely one of the reasons we're seeing this drop in alfalfa weevil levels. The other parasitoid that we are seeing is called Umizis. And you can see on the screen there's a very, very, it looks like a tiny black fly. It's actually a wasp uh, on the larva. That's Umizis. They lay their eggs right into the alfalfa weevil larva. The eggs hatch, and their young are living right inside the alfalfa weevil. Uh, their levels were increasing in Manitoba as well. So I think we've got now fairly decently established populations of Bathyplectes and Umizis in many areas. Once they get established, hopefully they will contain the alfalfa weevil and problem years will be just sporadic things. That's sort of the way things have played out in other areas of North America once alfalfa weevil has, has moved in. So we're hoping that trend continues here. 
So on to wheat midge. And Dave talked a lot about um, the staging of crops and fungicide spraying. Staging is very important when we talk about wheat midge as well. As far as scouting for wheat midge goes, you start your scouting right as the heads start to become visible on the plant. Now, in general, wheat midge populations in Manitoba have not been strong for the past several years. We have a parasitoid that I'll show you in just a few slides called uh, Macrogleans penetrans. It's a very tiny black wasp, and we had some very high levels of this wasp over the past several years. So overall across the province, I wouldn't say we're at high risk. There might be some areas and some fields where you have economic populations. I don't expect it's going to be a widespread concern this year. And again, that's because we do have some fairly strong macrogleans populations. So uh, Dave mentioned about anthers. And on the slide, on the picture on this slide, the wheat head on the left, it shows a few of the anthers sticking out of the head. The wheat head on the right, there is no anthers sticking out. So why anthers are important is because once you have anther production on a head, chemically the kernels are changing. And they're becoming um, to the point where they're essentially not palatable to wheat midge larvae anymore. So you have this narrow window between the time the heads start appearing and anther formation when the kernels are uh, palatable and a good food source for the larva. And then once you have anther production, they're no longer a good food source. So the wheat is only really palatable for a short period of time. So the wheat midge has that short window to work in to get their eggs laid and their larva developed. So once most of the heads, most of the main heads have anthers, you are in a situation where uh, you really don't need to be worrying about scouting those wheat fields anymore. They are naturally resistant to wheat midge. As a general rule, if about 80% of the wheat heads have anthers, you don't need to worry about uh, treating a crop or uh, assessing levels. Focus on your later seeded fields, your later maturing fields, the ones that are uh, heading out but don't have anthers. Those are the susceptible fields that you need to be assessing for wheat midge. So what you're doing when you're scouting for wheat midge, the, I guess, most accurate way to do it is to be going out there as close to sunset as you can. Um, I know this is inconvenient because it's late and you've got mosquitoes and things flying around, but it really is still our best method to go out there and see if you can see the uh, orange uh, midge flies flying around the wheat heads. Usually the way to do it is just crouch down in the field, uh, visualize about um, four or five wheat heads in front of you, and see if you can see any of the orange flies around those heads. Now, if on average you are finding a few of these flies every time you do this, you, you could have an issue in the field. If you are having trouble finding the wheat midge as you do this, you don't have an issue. And sometimes it's obvious one way or another when you walk in, if you're seeing orange flies all over the place, it might be evident that yes, we do have an issue. If you walk in and you're having trouble finding them, you don't have an issue. And it is good to be looking, scouting, because I mentioned we do have this parasitoid, macrogleans, penetrans, that is helping to keep the population stabilized. And if you spray a field that really didn't have wheat midge, but um, has a, uh, I guess, a favorable, favorable balance of parasitoids to wheat midge, essentially what you're doing is you're knocking the parasitoids back and potentially giving the wheat midge the upper hand for the next season. The other thing, just as a precaution when you're scouting, there is a fly called loxanid that is, um, they belong to a group that are they're, they're very similar to fruit flies, really. Um, loxanids are more robust than wheat midge, but still tiny little flies. They are extremely common. Their larvae feed on decomposing plant material. As adults, they really don't feed much. They will feed on dewdrops and things. Essentially, they're decomposers, these flies. And you will find them in wheat fields, soybean fields, canola fields, pretty much anything. Uh, because again, they're, they're not so much feeding on the crop, it's 
the decomposing plant material that would draw them to the field and that their larvae are feeding on. So again, they're everywhere, wheat fields or other crops. And many wheat fields, you will find a lot of loxanas if you walk through the field. You will see loxanas during the day walking the fields. You likely won't see wheat midge scouting during the day. They tend to stay very low, almost at ground level during the day, and the females come up at night to look for wheat to lay their eggs onto. So um, just be careful not to be seeing these kind of yellowish-orange flies, the loxanids, and mistaking them for wheat midge. And here's our field hero for wheat midge, the parasitoid macrogleans penetrans. Again, a tiny little black wasp. If you were to be sweep net sampling and you got a lot of these, you might think, oh, there's a lot of tiny little flies in my net. Uh, but if you look really carefully, they do have a constriction like a wasp, even though they're a tiny little thing. So they are flying around looking for um, wheat midge eggs, young larvae, and they'll be laying their eggs again right into them. And their larvae will develop inside the wheat midge and eventually killing them. Um, so they're probably the, the the main thing containing our population. Ground beetles also will feed on wheat midge larvae and pupa on and in the soil. So that's later in the season once they've dropped from the wheat heads and uh, early in the spring. But this time of year, macrogleans penetrans, that's the good guy out there trying to help control your wheat midge. So again, scout your midge and also keep an eye. If you are seeing a lot of these macrogleans, that's a good thing. So um, spraying for wheat midge, a few things to consider if you're in this situation. Um, there's really two chemistries registered, chlorpyrifos, which is your Lors band, Pyronex, Nufos, there's several names, and dimethoate is your other option, which is your Saigon, Lagon. They both do have very high pre-harvest intervals, uh, especially chlorpyrifos, 60 days. So if you were spraying now, it's late August, early September, before that pre-harvest interval has uh, completed its cycle. So again, just something to keep in mind. If you are spraying for wheat midge, um, keep in mind that they don't start coming up to lay their eggs on the heads until evening. So as late as you can spray is probably the better. Early morning might work, but I, I'm inclined to suggest going as late as you can um, in the, uh, the evening to spray the crop. Uh, dusk or, or in the evening, uh, just for better results. Edge spraying might be an option for some people. If you're rotating crops, as we recommend you do, uh, the wheat midge will be flying into your field, into this year's wheat from wherever last year's wheat fields were. So sometimes you do get very heavy edge effects. If uh, the wheat midge are all coming from a, a field that was, say, uh, a mile away, they're coming from a certain direction, you may have an edge effect starting to happen in that field. Sometimes you can detect that while you're scouting, and at times edge spraying can be an option. So maybe we'll end with that, and hopefully I've still got a few minutes that we can do questions if needed. Any questions, Laurie or Lionel? Uh, one question I have for you, uh, John, is... Uh, one of the questions I've been getting is uh, growing degree days and its relationship to wheat midge. Yes, so you can predict growing degree days uh, or wheat midge emergence by growing degree days. A uh, very good question. And um, I don't have a map to show you like Dave had for the um, fusarium, but we're at the point now growing degree day wise where we would be into what we call the early emergence. So wheat midge will be starting to emerge but they will not have peaked. That peak will likely happen in about a week to 10 days, and then after that peak, you'll still have some emerging, but it'll be a much smaller proportion. So um, now is a good time to start your scouting in those fields that don't have anthers yet, and just be aware that the populations probably will uh, gradually be increasing over the next week to 10 days. Yeah, I and, did get a uh, question here, Lionel. Okay. Uh, can you share the current trap counts and monitoring for diamondback moth and birth armyworm moth counts? Okay, for diamondback moth um, trap counts, 
Um, luckily, from the southwest, our levels are quite low. Um, most traps, it's under 50 moths over the total six weeks, which um, isn't extremely high. We do have pockets in the northwest, the southern interlake, and in around Steinbach that had some higher levels. Uh, the Bozeman area of the southwest, they had some traps that were, a couple of traps that were over 300 in six weeks. Um, Southern Interlake, the same thing, that Toulon, Arburg area, there were some very high trap counts. Now, um, with Diamondback Moth, I call them high herd trap counts. To, to be honest, we really don't know what they mean. Uh, what it does tell us is that particularly in those areas, you should be scouting for larvae in the fields. We have had years where we've had trap counts in around 300, and we don't see a lot of larvae. We have had other years where we get those counts, and we do. So, and to add to that, we have had years when we have had counts around 50, and we did have lots of larvae. So, these counts are a good tool to help you prioritize your scouting, and I would say for anyone in the Northwest, Southern Interlake, or around Steinbeck, do make diamondback moth scouting a priority when you're in your canola fields. Southwest, it's good to be looking for them. You're probably not as high a risk as the people further north. Uh, Bertha armyworm, uh, everything is still in what we call the low risk zone, meaning under 300 um, over our trapping period, but we're still early in the trapping period. Um, so just something we need to keep an eye on. The, the one precaution I have with Bertha armyworm scouting, people like to think they can make a prediction about the field the trap is in, which we can't. Um, it's a regional monitoring program. Uh, how many eggs get laid in a field depends more on crop staging than it does whether there's a trap in the field or not. So you can have fields right across the road from each other um, where one has a lot of Bertha armyworm and the other has very little, depending on the stage of the plants when the females were laying their eggs. So um, if by chance we do start going over 300 with the birth of trap counts, um, again, do not make assumptions about the field the trap is in. It's regional monitoring that we're doing for both of these insects. Okay, John, those are uh, a couple of good points, especially regarding the Bertha, because in the past we've had uh, uh, producers uh, actually adding insecticide to the fungicide when they're going out there based on those uh, those counts. So uh, uh, thanks for that and uh, thanks for the presentation today. It was uh, some really good information and uh, Laurie, if you show my screen, we will continue on with the rest of the uh, webinar here. Uh, I have a few slides just to show. Uh, one uh, regarding uh, what we've been talking about a bit today is the growing de degree days and uh, and the moisture that we've been receiving, both having impacts on on disease and uh, and on the uh, the uh, on insects uh, possibility of insect damage. Uh, so uh, good information on on this uh, this chart and good points about it is. Uh, our growing degree days are definitely getting closer to being normal. Uh, most areas are in the mid to high 80s to, to low 90s, which is great. And our percent of normal rainfall in a lot of areas is starting to become more more to normal. Uh, it's this map I seen the other day on uh, on Twitter, and I thought it would be good to put out. Uh, this is uh, the forecast for the next from the second to the ninth of July, and it's uh, showing that we could be looking at some rainfall uh, over the next uh, five days, again, which might have some uh, impacts regarding uh, decisions for spraying for disease. Dave Kaminsky showed this. This is the Fusarium map for July the second. Uh, I wanted to mention the crop diagnostic schools that are gonna be happening. Uh, I did mention last week that the 9th, 10th, and 11th are full. Uh, I think you need to call in and find out if the other dates are, are full yet. Uh, it is booking up fast, but I just wanted to put it out there again. Uh, make the call, find out what dates are still open. Uh, there may be some days that are full already. 
I also mentioned last week about the organic crop production field days that are going to be happening at the University of Manitoba, July 16th and 17th. And again, a good uh, couple of days for learning uh, some of the uh, new organic uh, programs that are being done out at the university. Uh, something new that's come up, uh, the Wado Field Day, uh, Tuesday, July 30th. I think this is something to mark on your calendar. It's usually a fairly good day with a lot of new and innovative things happening uh, out in the uh, Wado site down at Melita. Uh, definitely take your time to go out there, tour around, lots of plots, lots of trials, lots of new things from intercropping to uh, just different varieties and different pulse crops out there. So definitely go uh, mark that on your calendar. Uh, the seasonal reports, uh, growing conditions right now are probably our, our biggest uh, thing for the seasonal reports. Uh, the Fusarium forecast maps are on there. Uh, also the insect, weed and disease updates uh, information is there. So definitely go to this, our site and uh, get the information that you need to make decisions on the farm. Regarding uh, the, the extension specialists in the, in the province, uh, definitely give these people a call if you have questions regarding uh, anything going on in your field or things that you're hearing and want to get more information about. And as always, uh, join us next week, July the 10th. Uh, that'll be for our next crop talk. And if you're wanting to view uh, this webinar again or previous webinars, uh, there's a hyperlink uh, to go to here and then just our regular YouTube uh, link. So go to those and you'll be able to watch any of the previous uh, uh, crop talks as well as uh, all the future ones as soon as they get put up there. With that, Laurie, I think we're done for today. Thanks for everybody attending.